Okay, she has it right here. I don't know if you need any help. So uh, as soon as you get that set up, once again, let me just, everybody please welcome uh, Professor Gloria Brown Marshall. And she will be speaking on the great warrior queen, Anne Nzinga, who I've done a lot of research in uh, as an undergraduate student and as a uh, working my, on my degree in African studies at Temple University and Egyptology. And she's one of the most important people. And she may touch upon some other areas and other topics, like she might talk about Azinga Akum, you know, the king of the Congo, uh, commonly known as Alfonso I, and other things. So uh, Gloria is a wonderful speaker. We love having her here. We never get enough of her. I don't get enough time around her. And so without further ado, when you're ready, you can hook it up. Uh, Professor Gloria Brown Marshall. Oh no, I was doing that to the wrong way. It's not the fastest machine in the world. Oh, okay. So what time must you leave? They probably got about 45 minutes. Okay, all right then. Well, one thing. Oh, you found it. Yeah. One thing that um, you you may or, or may not know is that for me, this is research in progress, and so um, I. <laughs> hoping to have a research trip thank you to Angola to do further research along this line because um, and once again thank you thank you so much for coming out those who are interested in um, this this part of history and what I like to say to my own students and I teach constitutional law I teach race in the law at John Jay College, undergraduate as well as graduate level of civil rights and civil liberties courses. I'm also a playwright. And um, Jocelyn um, Cooper, who was a mentor of mine, and I always like to have intergenerational relationships. If you have a chance as a young person to actually interact with people, your grandparents, your aunts, uncles, people of generation or two ahead of you, they can really help you out in so many ways in navigating the world because they've seen a lot. And unlike your parents, sometimes you can hear them. <laughs> Like more so than you can do and when you have a relationship with your own parents. And I think that older generations, and I have relationships um, that I, friendships that I have with younger people, you know, and my intern from college, one of my first interns, became one of my best friends later on when she's grown. Now she's got four kids and working on her PhD, and we maintain that friendship. And I say this because following Queen and Zynga, was not something that was on my trajectory at the time. My area is legal history, civil rights, and the law, constitutional law, et cetera. But I like legal history, and I would go down to Jamestown, Virginia. In um, Virginia, deep in Virginia, our first colony is 1607, and Jamestown, Virginia. And within that colony, and you'll see this part as part of the presentation, we had the introduction of 20 Africans in 1619. So within less than 20 years of the formation of the first permanent English colony in North America, the New World, we have 20 Africans introduced into that colony. So when people talk about, um, oh, go back to Africa, or how long you don't really know this country, you have to realize that this English settlement wasn't even 20 years old, and it was the introduction of the Angolan Africans into that settlement that made it survive, because the settlement was dying. And just to put this in perspective, and as you leave here, understand, it was 1620 that the Mayflower landed. We were here before the Mayflower. Ding. And there are some people who say we were here in the 1400s as well as the 1500s. But we know there's documented proof. This is not wishful thinking. And what I like about law is that law is evidence-based. 
which means, and this is what I tell my students, during the lecture, you should keep a little notepad. Things the professor says, I don't believe that I'll look up later. Okay, <laughs> so it makes it a lot easier. That way they're not rolling their eyes and all this, you know, they just have a little note to the side, things the professor said, I don't believe. And then just say, okay, you can look it up later. That's what you could use Google for, look it up later. Okay, so if you want to know more about what I'm going to discuss here, you should be able to find it yourself. The interpretation of the information, that now is up for agreement, disagreement, etc. But the fact that it happened should not be. So you should not close your mind to the facts. You can close your mind to the interpretation I have of the facts, and you may have your own interpretation. That's where critical thinking comes in. As a professor, and they're all, we're always talking about we want people to think critically, but how do you know what critical thinking is? One way you think critically is to analyze the same facts I analyze, and then you come up with your supported reasoning for your disagreement. And we could disagree here or agree in other places, but it has to be supported. I feel like doesn't work. And if you want to use I feel like, then you can step aside and say, this is my instead of I feel like. Try this one out. My theory is, ah, doesn't that sound better? Instead of I feel like, my theory on that is, <laughs> it's the same thing. It's just like a very nice way of saying I feel like. Okay, so, but on the one hand, either way it goes, I want us to keep our minds open. My mind was open about these 20 Africans. The legal evidence supports the 20 Africans. You can go look that up on Google. People say I can look up everything on Google, but you don't know what to look up unless somebody tells you. So I want you to look up, not now, the 20 Africans arriving in 1619. My curiosity then becomes, based on this friend of mine who's older, who said she always wanted to live to go back for the 400th anniversary of the arrival of those 20 Africans, which will be in 2019. So what are people preparing for the commemoration of those 20 Africans? What's being put in place to commemorate their survival of the offspring of those Africans, which is us, okay? So having said and researched and gone down to Jamestown, I do this every year, to do more legal research on colonial history and race relations, I then ask the question, where did these Africans come from? Who were they? They weren't out shopping one day and said, oh, let's go to Virginia. I hear they have sales, okay? Where did they come from? Who were they? How did they get there? So that led me then on the path, what happened before 1619? And this then takes me to, and I hope it doesn't take me, where's our tech person? Okay, stay, stay close. Oh, yeah, yeah, stay close, okay. This takes me then to Nzinga. There were many warrior queens in Africa. And when you think about it, how many people have studied like Mary, Queen of Scots, or Queen Victoria, or you've watched Queen Elizabeth's reign, and you've seen these things? Well, those of you from Downton Alley, you know, and the rest are out Downton Abbey, wherever, you, see, you follow these different English stories. Here's one from Africa. This is an African queen who was fearless and ferocious. Now, when I visited Ghana, I learned about African queens there. And one of the things for the African warrior queens and the warrior women, some people, because I've been this height since I was 14, used to refer to me as an Amazon. And it was said in kind of like, you know, my older brother, in a derogatory way until I learned about the Amazon. And the Amazons were these warrior women of height, <laughs> of height, who ruled and had the leadership positions over certain males. The Amazons, that's why I say, you have one of those things on the list. Things she said, I don't believe, but I want to look it up. Okay, so just keep that list going over there. So now we know that the Amazons of South America, the Amazons of Africa, the warrior women, 
we know that England had its own type of warrior women and they ruled from the throne. Or you could have um, Joan of Arc in France, who was a warrior woman. So you had warrior women in history, but you just didn't hear about the warrior women in Africa. And the warrior women, this is, she's one example, and as was pointed out by Professor Conyers, there are many other examples, but this is the one that connected to me because I was doing research in this area already. Queen Nzinga, and her name changes t over history. People, have, you know, the, the way her name is spelled, so you might see her name spelled in different ways in addition to the Nzinga I have here. Um, of the um, Matumba people, even Matumba is spelled different. Some places, and you'll see it spelled differently here. It's M-A-T-U-M-B-A, -B -A, Matumba peoples. In Dongo, you'll see that spelled differently in different places. And some of this is the English, or in this case, Portuguese influence, where they came in and spelled the name as they thought they heard it. So once it's been translated a few times, it'll come up different ways. Okay, in Zynga. And Zynga now, let's, let's go back for one minute, 1583 to 1663. And this is a portrait of her, not that was done recently. This is a portrait of her that is over 200 years old. That's how much of a force she was in Europe back at that time. And she didn't step foot in Europe, but they heard of her reputation. There were stories told about her in Europe. That's how fierce she was as a warrior and a negotiator. And the reason why I'm also interested in her is because I'm interested in black women in the law and how long um, women, black women, or women of African descent, have been using the law as one way of getting what we need to improve our lives. From 1583 to 1663, so you see she lived a very long time. And she was a beautiful woman. In what we see now is referred to as the Angola region of Southwest Africa. She was born in 1583 to King Kowanji. Now, her father was the king or Angola. So when the Portuguese arrived, they heard the word Angola and thought that Angola meant Angola. So that's how the, the country became named Angola, but that was not the name of the country at the time. They were called the Ndongo people, and the different people had different areas. And the Angola was the ruler of the different people's groups. So they already had a sophisticated government in place, and we're going to talk more about that sophisticated government. Here we have a very curious child. Back then, they had different wives. So she was the child of one of the wives of the an Angola, the king. But she was so different from any other little girl because she used to hide behind the chair. And I don't know, you, maybe you've seen the chairs that the, that the tribal leaders sit on, so the big chair. So you, she used to be in the room when they were negotiating, when she saw the leaders, and especially her father, negotiate treaties. You know, he would be, you know, you might watch Judge Judy today and you imagine, you know, you're the ruler and your child is in the room as you negotiate conflicts between different groups. You decide what the prices of things are going to be. She got to hear all this, who would be put to death and who would be able to live based on what crime was committed. She would be in the room watching all these things as a little girl. She got to witness the power negotiations. And what I like to say to my students, I want you to become comfortable with power. I want you to become comfortable seeing power. Because once you're in the room and you can see power and you see how power works and you're comfortable with it, then when you're in a position, you can put yourself in a position of dealing with power as opposed to being afraid of power or afraid of your own power. And that's something that's happened to people, especially of African descent and of women. Sometimes we're afraid of our own power. We're afraid to even have it. We think, oh, I can't be responsible. I'm going to give my power to somebody else and wonder if they don't make the right choice, even sincerely, why you end up in some of the situations we end up in. So she was not afraid of power because she witnessed it as a child. And her father let her do it. So she was allowed to witness these things. She witnessed political strategy and intrigue. So this was her training ground, her training ground. And she also watched the warriors practice. 
And she was allowed to, she was that precocious. She would watch the Warriors practice, and then pretty soon, one of the trainers of the Warriors, when she was so curious, so how do you do this? Started training her in Warrior tactics. So she was taught these things, even though she was a girl, and this was very unusual. It was not the usual thing to have happen. It was, even for that time period, it was, it was somewhat unusual. There were other warrior queens, as I said before, but it's usually they rise up. Not all uh, women of African, um, within these African communities were taught to do these things. This is an image of the teenage growing up of, of in Zynga. So she, at this time now, this is of, of going back and put in, envisioning her now having learned these things what she would begin to look like, how she would um, present herself. We have the arrival of the Portuguese into Africa. Because we're, you know, as I said before, 1607, the, um, part of an English colony, we think that it was only England involved in the slave trade. But actually, um, the Western European nations were the superpowers at that time. And Portugal, which is now a vacation spot, anybody visit Portugal? I mean, it's like people go visit Portugal now. They don't even think of Portugal. It's like a footnote. Portugal used to be a superpower just like the United States is right now. It was that type of superpower. And Portugal, as a superpower, had one mighty strength. It's shipping. It built the most powerful ships, and the ships could go further than the ships from France or from Spain or England. So Portugal, because that was the main um, way in which a, a superpower would rise to economic dominance, became the dominant superpower at the time. It began to explore the southwest coast and the south coast of Africa. Initially, it was because rumors had it that there would be silver mines and gold mines and diamonds, and it was true. But once they came back, it's like, well, we want more of that. Well, let's go negotiate. Let's have treaties and find out. Let's find the leaders of the different places, the different tribal groups around the coast, or ethnic groups, or what we refer to now in many ways. But this was also something that was happening with other superpowers as well. That's how we have Columbus. And they said Columbus, you know, sailing, the, sailing to the New World, and of course he got lost. We had the Portuguese going to Southwest Africa. And we had, um, of course, France. Look at it this way. Think about where the languages are spoken in the world, and that's where the superpowers went. If you think about where Spanish is spoken, that's where Spain explored, dominated. I take this land in the name of the queen. All of this is happening. Think about where English is spoken in different parts of the world. If you think about where French is spoken, then you know where the superpowers spread out and declared, this is going to be now our territory. So we have um, Paulo Diaz de Nove, who comes to the port city that's been renamed, and this is another discovery, like I discover you, even though you've already been there, you already have a language, you have a culture, you have events, you have just lives that you're living, and then an outside invader, and I refer to them as, as invaders here, comes in and says, I now discover you in your home. Your home is now mine, I'm renaming your home, and I'm renaming you. You are now Brownites <laughs> of the land of Marshall. <laughs> so, and so, of course, and this is basically when you think about these names, how these people got named, how these cities were renamed. They had names before the outside invaders from the, from the Western European nations came in. And so the Ndongo people, ruled by the Angola, or king, were at first negotiators with the Portuguese. And the negotiations began over... Um, some of the natural resources that were found around southwest Angola. And I'm going to show you the map. And, um, and you, it's difficult to see. Um, I think, I hope it's the same way. Nope, doesn't work that way. Oops. Okay. If you can see along um, Africa, um, and it's, it's kind of small, but on the southwest um, side, further down, you'll see that Angola tips in. So at the top here, you notice that you have the Western countries, United Kingdom, see how small it is, you know, um, Ireland, these other countries, and then they dip down. Think about they're following the coastline. Some people don't realize when they talk about the relationship between Europe and Africa, just how close they are. And even now, what are you seeing? People from Syria and Greece. 
Remember, is anybody watching the news? And you see those people who are refugees from Syria now ending up in Turkey and Greece and other places. When you see the movements of peoples like that, today you think, well, how does that happen? They're, they're in little tiny boats crossing over in the channels in the most shallow places. So now we have the Portuguese who have the best ships of all the superpowers at the time. So their ships, and they were, they were geniuses at creating ships that could actually go through the Atlantic waters, and those were treacherous waters going along the coastline, and follow the coastline all the way down to South Africa. So that's what they were doing. And so from there, uh-oh, what did I do wrong? Okay. From there, you have the Portuguese who are encountering the leaders of the Angola section or Angola region of Africa. And this is what they said. In fact, this is what researchers have said. They encountered urban cities in West Africa comparable to those back in Europe, governed by elaborate dynasties organized around apprenticeship-based artistic guilds and with agricultural systems capable of feeding their large populaces. Many African cities were even deemed to be larger, more hygienic, cleaner, and better organized than those of Europe. And this comes from the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which is not a progressive, liberal, over-the-top organization. <laughs> it's one that does deep research before they would publish anything like this. And once again, here is the notation for it. If you want to find it yourself, you can. You can actually go to the Portuguese in Africa, 1415 to 1600, and look at this timeline and find the um, the way in which the Portuguese then must have felt when they encountered this civilization and their royalty, their negotiators, and they entered into treaties with the, the Angolans initially. But as I said before, the shipping power was also um, not just uh, of the highest level among the, the Western nations at that time, the weaponry was too. And once the Portuguese began to see their things they wanted that the Angolans did not give them, they began to say, I'll take it by force. So we have in this mix, this metropolitan community, Dutch traders as well. So traders from the Netherlands. All these, because the Netherlands at that time, once again, people might go to Amsterdam and go, wow, anybody from Amsterdam go to Amsterdam? Yes, and people go to Amsterdam, they visit, and I go, I've gone there and gone to the Van Gogh Museum. Some young people go there. I shouldn't tell you this, but yes, they have lots of marijuana. But, you know, they're, they're also in Amsterdam. But you, can, you don't have to go that way and go to Colorado now. But the, the, the thing about it is that's what it's known for at this point. But at the time, once again, it was a superpower. It was a superpower. And so the Netherlands had ships going up and down because all of the heads of these countries were saying, go out from the old world, which was Western Europe, and expand our territory into the new world, which was North America and South America and Africa, but especially North America and South America. Go expand our, our power, our authority. And so you had these ships like Columbus and the others going out into the, the new world and claiming the land. As I said, I claim your house in the name of my sovereign, the queen, the king, whomever. You are now part of the Netherlands. You are now part of Portugal. You are now, so the people, of course, are going to do what? Are you going to let me come and take your house? What are you going to do? Fight. You're going to fight. You're going to at least say no. You're going to fight. And so they would say, no, I'm not going to be part of you. I, I like my own culture. I don't want yours. Thank you very much. It's a nice option, but you can keep it. OK, so you had the Portuguese traders coming through as well. You have family dynamics. Remember, we have a young woman who's quite ambitious. And some people have said, and you might discover this as well, treacherous. And so she is looking at the Portuguese, and she's watching her father negotiate with them as she has done since she was a little girl. Her father dies. And now, as it is with the hierarchy, the male, the son, comes in. Now, I don't know if you've ever watched Empire, but this would be another way. I would like to see this version of Empire based on this story, because the son is a playboy. The son is not taking his responsibilities seriously, 
and the son likes money, the Portuguese begin by trading what they have for pepper, for ivory. And the ivory comes, of course, you know, from the tusks of the elephants, for different things. And they take some servants back with them, some of these African servants. Then they take more servants. And then they want more. It's like they have um, taken Brazil, or the area we now call Brazil, in, in South America, the Portuguese have taken this area as a colony and they need laborers because there are mines that need labor. There are fields and plantations that need labor. So they're taking the African laborers and they're putting them into Brazil and putting them in the West Indies and putting them into North America. And there's this insatiable need for physical labor and they are seeing the, the southwest and, and west coast of Africa as supplying that labor. And initially they're taking, at this point up to the 1600s, it was 175,000. And if they would have stopped at 175,000, that would have been one thing. But things begin to happen. Remember, it was 1607 that the Jamestown colony was founded here by the English. They now need laborers. You have southern colonies. They need laborers. All of these different now power um, uh, houses are going into Africa, taking the labor. What's happening to the native communities in South America? They're dying off. Their, their bodies, their immune systems are now being caught off guard by these European diseases. And so they're dying. The Native Americans are dying off. They're also being killed off. So all of this is happening at the same time as these Western powers decide they're going to build a powerhouse. And in the midst of it, between the, the strength of the ships and the weaponry of the Portuguese here, the Dutch, who are more interested in trade for the monetary reasons than trade, they're into the slave trade, but not as much as the Portuguese are. Her own people, who are looking at her as a woman to rise up, the other groups and tribes that her father has been negotiating with as, because the top of the pyramid is, is the father of, of Nzinga. All of these people are surrounding this woman. And she has to negotiate this minefield of all these things happening at the same time. She's got threats all over, and the king is her brother, and I refer to him as a boy king who's not a boy king so much that he's not a man, but he's not mature. And she sees all of these things, and she sees the Portuguese gaining more and more control over her homeland. She then witnesses the beginning of what we now know as the slave trade. She's seen it happen, and she's startled, and she's looking at this, because I don't know if any of you have ever gone to Ghana or any places, and you've seen the forts where they would have the people come in from the interior, forced by foot into these pits. Stay, they had to stay there, thousands sometimes, until the ships come. They're forced into the ships, and they would call the door they would leave through as the door of no return. She's watching her people leave and none come back. There are actual carvings that they put on the hillsides of people carved in wood who are sitting here like this, staring out to sea, like waiting for their people to come back. She sees now because she knows this is not right. And if these people continue, not only will they take the people who are already gone and have them not come back, they're going to take over this whole region. Her culture will be gone. It has disrupted their economy. And people don't talk about that in the African slave trade, the disruption of the African economies because of what the Europeans were doing. If you take away the strongest people, you take away the men, you take away people who could do the work, who's left? What's left of your economy? And you think about that. Some of you might come from small towns where the manufacturer left. And then after a while, what happens? The young people go away to college and never come back. The town then starts to die off. Businesses start to die. It's the same thing. They're taking away the engine of this society. And so the economy begins to crumble. The battles continue between the others who are trying to take over, saying a woman should not be in this position. And at the same time, as I said before, you have the Jamestown colony being founded and these 20 Africans 
who were part of an Angolan slave ship that battled on the high seas. And it's from that Angolan slave ship that had been taken from the Portuguese and then taken over, traded for provisions in Virginia from which you have the 20 Africans. So little by little, you see the people being pulled out, but this is, becomes millions later. But this time, you begin to see the root between the people who are here of African-American descent and their journey from Virginia back to, over those Portugal ships, back to Angola and how she was fighting to keep this from happening. And this is what really gets me, to have this one woman fighting her own brother, fighting her kinsmen, fighting the Portuguese, and she decides the enemy of my enemy is my friend. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. Who's the enemy of the Portuguese? The Dutch. So she then gets in a relationship with the Dutch to say, okay, I'm going to now make you my ally so we can both fight against. This is what she learned as a little kid, watching her father negotiate these things between opposing parties and realizing that if you can't win by yourself, then you better get allies. The other thing that we have that's happening, and, and as I said, the 20 and odd Negroes aboard the ship, you can find out more about that, and that Mary and Anthony Johnson, for those of you who may not know, Mary and Anthony Johnson, Anthony Johnson from Angola, Mary, they were Maria and Antonio Johnson, their names of course were not that when they were in Angola, but their names were changed first by the Portuguese and then they decided to make them English names when they became part of the Virginia colony. Mary and Anthony Johnson, I like to say before there was, you know, Barack and Michelle Obama, there was Mary and Anthony and they were the first couple, first African couple, they got married in the Virginia colony in the 1600s, bought land and had white and black servants of their own in the 1600s. In the 1600s, I know, things that she says that I don't really believe I'm gonna look up later. Okay, you have the ivory, remember? And so you can go to the Metropolitan Museum. If you haven't gone, you really should because students get in free. Well, you pay what you want, so that's free put down a quarter. You can put down a quarter, 50 cents. You get into the New York's finest museum, one of the finest museums in the world. They not only have, of course, the Egyptian exhibits that you must see, but they also have these exhibits. This is made out of elephant tusk ivory. That's a carving of a Portuguese merchant that was carved by the Angolans. And that is in the Metropolitan Museum. And you start to see this connection. Remember, they were there to get ivory. So there are many ivory pieces in the Metropolitan Museum that evidence the relationship, the friendlier relationship from the 1500s before the uh, Portuguese decided, instead of negotiating for what we want, we're just gonna take it. Queen Nzinga is this shrewd negotiator. She's now negotiating. It's like some of these things are a little bit out of time, but it's okay. She's negotiating with the Portuguese governor. Now the Portuguese take over Luanda and decide it belongs to the Portuguese and we're gonna give you a governor. That's why I said they come and take your house and decide not only do I run your house, but now I set the rules. And here's the person who's gonna keep the rules. And this governor, and this governor, Correa da Sousa, then is someone she meets and decides, I have to make this person my friend. And I'm not quite sure how, but I'm in a weakened position. So Nzinga is sent by her brother, who doesn't have time for any of this, to negotiate with D'Souza. Here is a real life true story that's been told for generations. When she arrives the first time to meet with Governor D'Souza, she walks into the room, and in the room you have D'Souza seat seated, and you have all of his entourage seated, and there are no other chairs. Okay, there are no other chairs. So she's standing there with her entourage and they're talking to her. They're seated and she stands. Now she has two choices, remain standing or what else? Sit on the floor. She's a queen. So what she decides to do, she calls over one of her servants and she asks her servant, 
to put down their hands and get on their knees. And she sits down on the servant's back. And from there, she has her own chair to negotiate. Just to let them know, you're not going to get the best of me. That is such a well-known story that there are images of this story of her negotiating with him, sitting on the back. In books in Europe, as I told you, that's how powerful she was, how shrewd she was, that she knew if she sat down on the floor that that lowered position would have her in a lower position forever in this negotiation. And she was not going to stand like she was a common person because a common person stands in front of somebody of authority, that she was going to sit like the rest of them sat. So that's where you see this image. You'll see this image in different, different uh, other um, uh, publications as well of her meeting with the Portuguese governor, who was so impressed by her ability to think that out so quickly that they gained a, a, a deeper respect for her as a negotiator. And she's there to negotiate um, the treaty. At one point during one of the negotiations over time, um, and Zynga's army had captured some of the Portuguese and held them prisoners of war. So, and the, they had a negotiating, uh, negotiating um, session, and the, 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 one of the governors said, you know, that at another time, I'm going to go very quickly to take up time, um, that, the, that the governor said, well, we want you to release our, um, our people. You have them prisoner. And she told them, I'll give you your prisoners when you give me back mine. So go find the Angolans that you've taken from here, wherever they are, and bring them back. And when you bring my people back, I'll let your people go. And she meant it. She did not release the prisoners at that time. So she then becomes queen. Now, a few things happen as well. She realizes Portuguese are Catholic. And they're looking at her like, you know, Africans who believe in more natural traditions of some, their own traditions, religious traditions, that they must be heathens. So she decides to convert to Catholicism. Now, is this a, a political strategy? Does she really believe it? Since she's, she's doing what they want to see as a Catholic by day and practicing the religion she had before by night. So she never really gives up her religion, but she does change her name. And that governor de Souza was so impressed that he told his wife, and his wife then becomes her godmother and helps her in her conversion to Catholicism. And for, yes, and for a while now, they see her as an equal almost, or at least someone that they can now negotiate with over time as a Catholic and not a heathen. And so her name then becomes Queen Anna de Souza in Zynga in Bande. So her, as I said, her name is fluid. It changes with the events and times that are going on during that time period. But her strategy only worked so far as that governor, D'Souza, was in place. Once he was replaced by somebody else, that other person was not as kind at all. And that broke political ties. It was the, the word from Portugal, we want the slaves, we want the minerals, we don't need to negotiate, we're coming in to take it. At that point, Many things happen. About 1617, Portugal starts an all-out invasion of Indingo um, region. Her brother, the Angola Mbandi, allows the invaders, that's what history says, I'm still trying to find more out you know, about that, that he allowed the invaders in, maybe because he was afraid of them and thought he was going to lose anyway, maybe for money, maybe a little bit of both, maybe he did not have the courage that she had. But she watched her brother um, capitulate to this and was enraged that he would allow these Portuguese to come in and take over their land and give up without a fight. So now the Portuguese are going even deeper into um, Africa, deeper into the Ngandu in, in region. And the Dutch relationship becomes powerful enough to weld off the, um, the ward off the, the um, Portuguese for a while. But Nzinga knows, given the fact that her brother is a weakling, the boy king, that she needs to do something and do it fast. Here's where things get a little dicey. The brother commits suicide. I say that because word has it that she killed him and his son. So, because she thought she should be the person leading the country and that he was leading the country in a, in a way that was going to um, end up with the Portuguese taking over everything. 
So the word is that she poisoned him or he committed suicide. It's one or the other. You know, I'm not quite sure that's still up for a debate. History says one thing or the other. But at the end, the brother's dead. <laughs> and she becomes the full queen. And when she rises up, as I told you, it's just a treacherous situation. But there's nothing more going on here in many ways that weren't going on in England with Henry VIII chopping off the heads of wives he didn't like and all of these other things. That's why I said this is just such a dynamic story of this woman who's now full queen before she had to do things with her brother's permission. Now that the brother's gone and the brother's son, just because if it hadn't been for the brother, then the brother's died, then the next male would come up and would be the son. So both of them had to go. We think technically. Okay, so now she rises up. She takes on the allies of the Dutch. She and her army now, with the Dutch, war fight off the award off the, the, the Portugal Portuguese for a little bit longer. And um, there's all out war now. But she's also doing something very shrewd because you can't just have war all the time. You've got to feed the troops. You've got to have money coming in. So she also maintains commerce with her region and the other superpowers so that money keeps coming in because you have to have some way to finance these troops. So she's maintaining a financial position for as long as she can with the Dutch and with another um, of, the, of the world powers. Treaties are taking place during this time. And each time there's a treaty that the, that the Portuguese say they're going to stop at a certain place, they would turn around and break the treaty and go further into an Angola to get more and more Africans. That's how greedy they were for this human cargo they thought was endless. And if they could go further into the interior of Africa, going through the, the, the uh, coastline into the interior, they could get more to feed this thirst, this hunger for what they considered free labor. This is another image. Of uh, that's been made of an of Nzinga negotiating. Now, some people have said that she was gay. Some people have said that she had um, like a an entourage. She replaced her entourage of women with men. We're not sure. I don't know. That's why I say some people have said anything that I don't know from my research to be exact. I put it as some people have said. But you have her here smoking this pipe which is something that a woman wouldn't have done back then. Sometimes very, very old women were allowed to do these things. If they were, say, the, the mother of the king, they would be allowed certain privileges, like being able to smoke and do things. But someone of her stature, of her age, I mean, she's able to do this because she wants to. That's how much power she has. And you see them bending to her. Queen Nzinga's reputation expanded, but unfortunately, so did the power of the Portuguese. They overran the Dutch, and the Dutch was fighting, at that time, the Dutch were also fighting a battle with England, and that battle was taking place right in New York. That's why it's called New York, which it used to be what? New Amsterdam. New Amsterdam because New York used to belong to the Dutch. That's why I said this is how widespread these superpowers were, so that the Dutch and the English had, were, were battling. The Dutch lost, and that's how it became New York. York is a northern city in England. That's why it's New York. Instead of Jersey is a southern island off of England. That's why it's New Jersey. All of these different you know, places are renamed based on who's in power at the time. And the last treaty between Queen and Zinga, now that she's in, in uh, Matamba, she has to leave. Luanda, she has to leave the city center and fight from the hills because the Portuguese have all out warfare. Remember, they have more sophisticated weapons. And the other men who were part of, of the, the military, half of them or even more, broke off and went over to say, we're going to allow the Portuguese, like the brother wanted, come in and do as they please. And so she took those warriors who would fight with her and went up to uh, Matamba from in the hills. And she fought a guerrilla warfare battle to her last day. And it was so intense that the Portuguese feared nightfall because she would come in. She would swoop in, and she did not take many prisoners. When she came in, she came in to take lives. And they knew it. So they knew one false step. If Nzinga came in, you're done. 
and they never knew where she was going to strike. She was a brilliant strategist. She would, she would find ways to destroy their food lines. She would do all the things you see in military today and military tactics she was doing back then. The last treaty, as I said, was um, in 1657. Her greatest battle was the battle in 1648. This is the statue of her that is in Luanda in um, Angola. And one of the things that, not just in Brazil, where they still talk of her, but in other places, they still talk of Queen Nzinga. And I guess the legacy for her in, in, in Angola and in Brazil and other places, I would like very much to make sure that people understand two very important things from this as I close. One is that there were Africans who were part of the slave trade, who were duplicitous in um, making money off of the continuation of the slave trade. Slavery didn't begin in Africa. If you think about it, the Israelites were slaves in Cairo and Egypt. So Egypt is in Northern Africa. So if it makes people have a difference when it comes to slave, slave trade to realize that those Northern Africans had Israelites as slaves, that the Christians were slaves by the Romans, that you had slaves in Eastern Europe, you've had slaves throughout history. However, you rarely hear about the people in this time period who actually fought to stop it. And for it to be a woman who spent her life fighting to stop the slave trade, I think it's amazing in the fact that she died of natural causes at the age of 83. Fighting until the bitter end, her sister inherited the throne, but it wasn't until decades later that the Portuguese then decided in some of the worst of human atrocities to butcher all the Angolans who stood in their way and to take as many people as possible and to try to destroy a culture. And it was over time, not just the, the Portuguese, but the English as well as the French and the Spanish um, became part of we know now as this globalization, this atrocity known as the transatlantic slave trade. And Portugal um, finally was fought in a way in which it would release Angola as a colony, and it gained its independence in 1975. Thank you. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. I don't think I've ever seen anyone do a better job in such a limited amount of time on explain, I, there was nothing I could say. I mean, you know, explaining the history of Anne and Zinger, and that includes Dr. John Henry Clark, who was our, our teacher and, and a master in just such a short period of time. Uh, you know, that's why I always love when Gloria comes, because, you know, just because we know a lot of history doesn't mean that we can present the history well. And she always presents it well. I just have two, two things to add to it. Uh, Gloria was talking about the, how the, uh, the Europeans and the Portuguese and others spoke about the organization of African cities and towns. Well, she mentioned one of the resources there, but there's uh, quite a few of them. And there's one easy reading book, and I read this, uh, I don't know, over 40 years ago, uh, easy reading book called The Lost Cities of Africa, where you could actually see the diagrams that the Europeans made by Kana. I can't remember Kana's first name. I think it's Jonathan Kana. It's still available. You can still get it at Barnes & Noble, and you will actually see the diagrams and read the discussions of that. Another question arises, and I'm just going to say a little bit about this, because I know you have questions. The question arises, and I know you probably thought of this, why were the Portuguese the first to set sail? Oh. Don't you want to talk about it? Okay. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm raising. I was going to talk about it, but I'm going to let you talk about it. Okay. No, no, but you can come on up. You did such a wonderful job. I don't think you'll miss anything. And if you do, I'll say something. Okay. Well, I'm like you, because I have my professor. He's my professor. So it's like I'm thinking, oh, no, I'm going to have flunked that quiz. Um, <laughs> but there was a, you've heard of the plague, right? The, the, black, the black plague. We were like, well, that's another story. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so, the, so the black plague was taking place. Was that the one? Was that, okay. Yeah. So I want you to give the other part. The black plague had taken place. And so it wiped out millions. It was like a quarter of the population, if not half of the population was wiped out by the plague. The plague did not reach Portugal in the same way it had England, France, and those other Western European countries because where Portugal was situated. 
So it was able, because Portugal is a coastal country, but um, so it was in the shipbuilding, but so was England, a coastal country. So they both had, you know, great ships. But Portugal was located in a place that was somewhat isolated, and so it did not have its population decimated by the plague. And it was a shipbuilding country, so it was allowed to experiment. And they had, they had scientists who had brought a scientific mindset to shipbuilding. So it wasn't just a ship to be built to go out and fish that they actually figured scientifically what was the best way to create a ship that would be able to go through the waters, the treacherous waters on the sides of the coast. That's exactly right. And in a strange way, and we forget this quite often, that the Portuguese were beneficiaries of the Moors. Yes. All right? The Moors occupied Western Europe for approximately, and the number varies, from 711 to 1492, which is approximately 774 years. Uh, without the Moors in Western Europe, a lot of what people now accredit to Europe, okay, would not be there, actually came from the Moors. One of the things that the Moors did, not to talk, uh, later talk about Henry the Navigator, who didn't do any navigating, uh, which he didn't. He founded a school of navigation. Uh, one day I'm going to go, I'm going to do another lecture. I was saying yesterday I was going to do a lecture on the history of the Congo. And last year I did a major lecture at the university on another warrior queen, Hatshepsut. You know, and we'll, we'll talk about that at another time. But I mean, some of the, the creative things that the Moors had done, because during this period, you know, the science of the Moors actually led the world in science. And uh, they translated uh, ancient texts and so on, and, you know, founded the, uh, in Spain also, in Spain, the University of Salamanca in Spain, which is one of the first major universities in Europe. But the, the importance of this, that the Portuguese had inherited a lot of the, they liberated themselves from the Moors, before the Spaniards did. And so they were innovators in terms of this science that had been left, for instance, the Latin sail. I don't know how many people know what a Latin sail was, but up until this particular point in time, most European ships could not sail unless there was a wind. The Latin sail was a sail that you could move and catch the wind in whatever direction it was in and allowed you to sail. So again, in a, some strange way, I mean, the way history works, the Portuguese, as well as the Spaniards and others in Western Europe, were, you know, had a, the, a legacy of all of this science and technology and even Chinese science, uh, the lodestone and other things that they were beneficiaries of at that particular point in time. The Dutch, too. I mean, the Dutch, the low country actually was a part of Spain for a long period of time. The Dutch were engaged in wars with the Spaniards over dynastic stuff in terms of who was going to rule over Holland. And so we have that whole play uh, coming into, uh, you know, into our minds also. But again, as Gloria pointed out, the plague, as well as being the beneficiaries of this science that had been left behind during this great period of about 774 years, allowed Portuguese to be the first. You know, so you had a whole bunch of Portuguese seamen, as Gloria pointed, going all the way down into South Africa, st establishing a base in South Africa, and then later on, you know, the House of Orange would come in, and you, you got a lot of stuff that we don't know. That's why these discussions are so important, and that's why I love for Gloria to come back again and again and again, because she does it better than anybody. You know, I wish I could do it as well as she does it in such a limited space of time. So, Gloria, once again, thank you. And if you have any questions, Gloria's back up here to answer those questions. You know, oh, uh-huh. Yeah, I have a couple questions. Um, one is, what was the life like for the ordinary women, mm -hmm. and were the gender relations more egalitarian in that culture than, say, they were in the, in the European countries? This is, I, I think that's kind of tricky. Maybe that's part of what I will look at more in my research, because I like to, to speak from a point of strength, and the strength it, that I have is on the unique relationship and so when I started looking at what the regular women were doing, and I know that there were some who had positions of authority, but even in England, most of the women didn't have positions of authority. I mean, they, they still were, it was like the unique relationship was the queen. And if she had, had not been born into that family, then she would have been cooking and cleaning and doing all the other things that the women were doing. Or even if she was in the royal court, she would still be of a lower stature and having less, po less power than the men. So this, this right of birth is this very unique thing and how women could rise up based on their birthright 
uh, in certain um, societies, but yet every other woman is not seen that way. The woman's status in, in quite often was different, not necessarily inferior, but, but different. The only society that I can think of that I know about, which is what I you know, specialize in, where women virtually had exactly the same status in, among the common women as the men did, was in ancient Egypt. Virtually the same status. Women could own businesses, they could sue in court, they can do whatever they want, independent of their husbands. And even among the royal family in, in ancient Egypt, the women had an amazing amount of power. And one of the major powers that they had in ancient Egypt was that if it was the right of the king to rule definitely came through the woman. Without having a woman of royal blood in the family, no king, no so-called pharaoh. That word didn't exist in ancient Egypt, by the way, the word pharaoh. But no king of Egypt could rule. So every king had a combination of wives. He had a great wife, he had the royal wives, and he had a concubine, but it was through the great wife. This is why you had these dynastic rivalries in ancient Egypt when there was no great wife. But the woman, the average woman in ancient Egypt, as compared to other places in the ancient world, had virtually the same exact status as a man, and in certain respects, even a better status because she was exempt from certain things. The ancient Egyptians used to say, the word for a wife or woman in ancient Egypt was hemet. And that word meant a well of water. And so the ancient Egyptians said a woman was like a well of water. And I guess you can figure out why. Because you get everything from a woman, right? So thus, a woman should always be respected. The hot, one of the highest goddesses in Egypt, this god, goddess actually is over all the other gods, over Amun, over Ra, over you name it, actually over the, the goddess of Ma'at, who brings balance and order to the universe. Without her, no other god can exist. So that says something right there. But in every other case throughout Africa and every other place, a lot of times the woman did not, did not have exactly the same status, but it was not necessarily in many places an inferior status. It's just a different status. And there are several books on this. Uh, and I, can't, I can't think of the title right now. Women's, uh, the Status of Woman in Ancient Africa, and, I, and it covers a lot of places, and I think that's by William Brown. I have it in my library somewhere. I have to give glory the reference for it and whatnot. That deals with that. There's a lot of controversy over, over that everywhere else, you know what I mean? But glory is right in terms of the European houses. You know, Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth became powerful, certainly because of her father, Henry VIII, and you know how she came, and she was just as treacherous as he was. She cut off as many heads and embalmed as many people. You know, it wasn't just, you know, uh, uh, Bloody Mary. I mean, Elizabeth did all of the things, it was, and so did Cleopatra, you know what I mean? The Ptolemies was a treacherous family. And so again, these women rise up because of the, the, their birthright and become powerful while the average woman doesn't necessarily have that, that status. But in ancient Egypt, the average woman did have a superior status, you know, based, I don't know of any culture in ancient, in ancient times where the woman had that equivalent status. Yeah, yeah. One way a woman could rise up in her status in Africa, and that is in certain situations that would allow her to become a warrior. Yeah. And this is how much they would sacrifice to be a warrior. If you think about anybody who's had a bow and arrow, anybody do any, you know, you know, so what do you have to do? You have to, rock, you know, pull it back, whatever. So now what's in the way? The yes, the breast. So to prove how much they would cut it off they would cut off their left breast so they could get better aim with the bow and arrow. And the fact, yes, and the, these, these women are serious. And that's what they would do so that they would have better aim so they could kill more of the enemy. And it was also a way in which they could prove just how courageous they were and how serious they were. So, you know, when you think about these, these warrior women of Africa, and I, I just like the idea of, of, of this sense that that bloodline runs through me. And that, you know, and that's, that's why I began by saying too many women are afraid of their own power. And you need to embrace your power and learn how to use it like a resource, like everything else. It doesn't have to be an either or situation. Like if I have power, I'm going to do bad things. Stop yourself. <laughs> Don't do bad things. It's like a car. You know, just because you have a car doesn't mean you're going to run over people. So you know how to drive, <laughs> so 
so you can learn how to use your power in a way that can be beneficial to the world and to protect yourself. So, you know, this, this, this has gotten lost, and that's what, what um, Professor Conyers is saying. It's like there are much longer periods of time where women have been in positions of power than they've been subservient. And so you've got to go into, but that DNA is there. The DNA is running through your, your, your bloodline. It's in you. So in figuring out how to tap into that DNA, it rises up. You might just be pushing it down. You know, stop pushing it down. Let it come up and see what you can do with it. There was a question somewhere over? Yes. I was wondering if you could touch on some of the primary sources um, for your research. Like, what are the primary sources that you writing? Oh, yes. The Portuguese, as a matter of fact, I had a chance to interact with the ambassador from Angola to the United Nations. And I've spoken with them several times. They have a relative who just passed away that I planned on interviewing. And I'm also going to Angola, you know, this year. Um, one of the, I guess, the obstacles is that at this point, I don't speak Portuguese. So I am trying to have the Portuguese primary sources um, um, translated for me. So that's what's going on right now as we speak. They've written, they have their primary sources and they've been writing about her for some time. And one of the things they're excited about actually, and they've been very supportive of my taking on this research junket because they want the rest of the world to know about Queen and Zynga. And because not enough of their um, researchers speak English, we're kind of like at this juncture where they can't get the word out to the rest of the world the way they want to. So I'm acting as a conduit of sorts, which I'm proud to do. I'm very honored to be part of a conduit of, of others who are actually trying to get the word out about Queen and Zynga. Uh-huh. Yes, it is. I mean, my, my background is as a civil rights attorney. So I still am a civil rights attorney. I still am a practicing civil rights attorney. Um, I'm a professor at John Jay College, and as I said before, I teach constitutional law, race and the law, gender and justice. So this all kind of comes together because I really love legal history. I like to... Yes, yes. And, and so one of the things I like, also I have a radio show. So my show is Law of the Land on WBAI. I don't know if anyone hears it from Tuesday, on Tuesdays from 10 to 12, just a little Law of the Land with Gloria J. Brown Marshall. Okay. <laughs> and so, so one of the things that I like doing is taking historical um, incidents, people, um, legal cases. And that's how I came to know her. As I said, I was researching black women in the law. And I wanted to know how far back we've been doing this. So even as a civil rights attorney, when I had cases, and I would be in these little small towns in the South, working on these civil rights cases in these small towns in Alabama and in Georgia, and these, they, didn't, they weren't really hotels, they were more like motels. And so it would be late at night and there's nothing to do, and I would just think about how long have people have been doing this? How long have they been going to these little towns, taking on these civil rights cases, working with the community? And so that's what started my book, Race, Law, and American Society. I started looking at the cases and I thought, oh, it probably goes back to the 1960s. And then I would say, oh, no, it goes back to the 1860s. Then I was in the 1760s, and next thing you know, I'm in the 1600s. So now you're watching as I go past the 1600s into the 1500s, how long people have fought the power that tried to oppress them. That's what I find so fascinating and satisfying about this, that I'm just one person, one drop in the bucket of people who said no. And I think it's amazing. These black women said no all the way back then against those odds. And so, you know, this idea of what the, what the passion is in research, and um, even though my research, this trained research, is in law, I still do this historical legal research to find out who these people are who said no and the sacrifices they made. And it gives me great pleasure that she died at 83. And that you can live a good life still saying no, even though many people have had their lives and livelihoods sacrificed in saying no. But in this particular time where everybody feels so vulnerable, 
that power is going to crush them. And then you have to ask yourself, like they must have, what's the alternative? Do you want to live on your knees? And I'm sure that's what she saw in her brother. It's like if you capitulate to the Portuguese, we're going to live on our knees. What kind of life is that? I don't believe in living on my knees. I don't look good that way. I really believe that we should, we each have a power to stand up and, and fight for it, what it is that we want. And to, as she did with the Dutch, find alliances. What, who are our allies? If you do this individually, she'll fall. The things that she taught, that she knew from actually watching her father do it and what she was able to do, to reach out to another group outside of herself. She didn't, the Dutch didn't look like her and she didn't look like the Dutch. They had different religions, different cultures, but they had one thing in common, and that was the need for both of them to survive, and they had a common enemy. So they came together and said, we're going to fight this common foe because if we stand alone, we're going to fall alone. So I want us to continue, to continue to take on the knowledge for what we can from these different people in time. Uh -huh. One final question. Oh, I don't have a question, but I do have a comment to make mm -hmm. um, about the Roman Catholicism aspect. And I want to say thank you for mentioning that. Because a lot of times when people, um, particularly within the African-American community, they talk about Nzinga's legacy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But with everything, there was balance. And so I think that would be something important to look into um, as the African community, American community as a whole, that we did have a lot of African leaders who were religious, but they understood that need for their people. Religion shouldn't inhibit your ability to defend yourself and defend your land. So I, I thought it was great that you brought that up because a lot of times when people talk about the that they kind of put that to the side Mm -hmm. Well, I think is it, and also the role that religion played in in the, in the 1600s um, when the when the slave trade was beginning in North America, one could avoid or, or leave bondage by converting to Christianity, and then the landholders saw, well, this isn't going to work for us because it's like, okay, I can no longer be a slave if I become a Christian. Well, thank you, Jesus. I'm free. Okay, so people then took on Christianity and they said, no, no, God now says that you must be in bondage and serve me forever. That's what God is saying. It's like, okay, you have this conversation with God. So they would have this interpretation of the Bible. And that's why reading is so important, because if you don't read yourself, then your interpretation is what somebody tells you it is. You have to, especially college students, and you have this great tool you know, called an iPhone. And I, I don't, I call it an iPhone now because I, the smartphone means it has to be used for smart purposes. And if you're not looking things up with Google or whatever your search engine is and you're just sending text messages and having telephone calls, then you have a wealth of information right there in your hand. Libraries of the world are in your hand in that phone if you would just look it up and find it. It's all these languages, everything. So when you think about the, how religion was used as a tool for oppression. There are many people today who don't want to be part of any type of organized religion because they said, oh, it's just a tool for oppression. So if you're going to take it on and make it oppress you and think that's the only thing that you can get out of it, then I can see why either way it's like an all or nothing thing. But as you pointed out, it's not all or nothing. People can practice a certain religion and have other practices as well. It all depends on your take on religion and what you can take from it. Um, the last thing I'd like to say about Queen Nzinga is that her story to me is so important that I'm really interested in writing a play about her. So that's the other thing that I, that I want to do because sometimes you can have people listen to a lecture, not because you're required, I'm sure. You would have been in here anyway. But sometimes it's easier to get something across if you can do so 
in something like, you know, showing the story on television or in, you know, a cable program or something like that or on the stage. And I'm also a playwright. So it's something that I'm interested in doing as well in trying to figure out what's the best way for people to take Queen and Zynga and make her a real person and not just a historical figure, but somebody we can not just learn from, but be empowered by. One day I can get Gloria to help me, because uh, I know nothing about playwriting. Uh, help me uh, write a play about someone I wrote my PhD dissertation on, Edward Wilmot Blyden, who's another historical figure that many people know nothing about, but everybody should know something about him. All right, the best known black person during the 19th century, bar none. And in the 20th century, 21st century, most people never even heard the name. All right. People heard of Marcus Garvey and Booker T. Washington and Monroe Trotter and Ida B. Wells. Well, Blyden superseded all of them, you know? He saw the whole picture. While each one of them emphasized an aspect of the picture, Blyden emphasized the whole picture. And so he's someone that, you know, we need to have some further discussions on. And why not? one final thing, uh, and this is an aside from here. On April 2nd, if any of you are in New York City, City College, I'm gonna be moderating a panel. The, uh, uh, the New York Association of Africana Studies is having its conference April 1st and April 2nd at City College. And I will be my, they, I was called up and asked to write a paper, but I didn't have the time to do that, so they asked me to pull together a panel. The conference basically is on the politics of music, African American music and art. And I pulled together a panel of some luminaries who are friends of mine, and we're gonna be discussing the music and the politics of the great jazz legend Jackie McLean, who helped to raise me. And so we have uh, the great jazz, legendary jazz pianist, Randy Weston. I called him up the other day. He's agreed. We have Renee McLean, who's going to be here next week. We have uh, Brother Kamara, uh, Kamuli Kamara, who's a well-known percussionist. And we're going to have Sister uh, Dr. Ab uh, Rashida Abubakar, who will be on the panel. So if you guys are in the city at that time, and I'll post the information, please come in and join us. It should be a lively discussion. And there's a lot people don't know about Jackie McLean. Many people probably never heard the name, but believe me when I tell you, this is somebody you should know about in the what we call the African-American music world and in that genre of African-American music called jazz. So if you're around, please come. Thank you for coming out. Thank you, Gloria Brown Marshall. You know, she makes me feel so good when she comes. I, I don't even want to say anything. After she talks, I don't want to say nothing. That kind of thing. Uh, I hope to see you guys next week. Remember, next Tuesday we're going to have, and she, she, Gloria probably will be here for that, we're going to have the ambassadors, we're going to have free food and all of that uh, here next week. And then on Wednesday, Wednesday evening, Renee McLean will be here to Concert for Understanding with his group. And again, we're going to have that open mic for those of you who want to do some performances, and all you have to do is come by the office and let us know what you're going to do. And it's going to be the live music, and we're going to record the whole session, so we're going to have a good time. Thank you for coming out. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.